to start by saying that I am so incredibly grateful to be here. And by here, I mean, of course, here in this room with you. But by here, I also mean I am so grateful to be alive and truly living. So I've said before that poetry saved my life. But today, I want to change that script a little bit and say that actually, it was collaboration, so writing in community with other people, that saved my life. So part of what I want to do here is actually expand our conventional definition of collaboration. So for example, you will notice that we are joined here by a cellist. This is Emily Ann Peterson. <clears throat> and so she's going to join in the conversation today, but I actually want you to know that I consider this to be a three-part collaboration. So Emily is bringing sound, and I'm bringing words, and you all are bringing the crucial ingredient of witness. It's like a creative potluck. <laughs> so I've brought for you today uh, an artifact up here on the screen of my very first collaborative writing project. This was my first book. I wrote it when I was four years old with my mother. So this is how this worked. Um, my mom would sit on the couch with me right before bedtime, and I would tell her stories, and she would write them down word for word, and I would look over her shoulder to see how she was doing it. And uh, you know, the book, of course, is actually a journal. And I'll give you an example of our results there. So this is an illustration for a story that begins like this. My four-year-old self, here we go. There once was a mother unicorn who lived in a palace. <laughs> she wanted to have a baby. It was going to be a boy, or so she hoped. When the time came, she had a baby and named it Skylight. So there you have the illustration of baby boy unicorn skylight and my little signature. And here's another example of my uh, four-year-old handiwork there. Um, so I bring this today because I think it's cute, um, but also because I believe creative collaboration refers to a state that we're actually all naturally in from the very beginning as humans, right? Because fundamentally, we need each other in order to realize our potential. I had that story about the baby unicorn in me, but I couldn't write it down unless I had my mother there to spell out the word skylight for me. Now, culturally, in terms of you know, white, middle-class, mainstream America, we're actually, we actually grow up to learn to value the opposite of collaboration. After childhood, we learn that success and independence are synonymous. And even as artists, right, as much as we might like the idea of collaboration, there's this idea of scarcity that's out there that tends to trump that. And the scared artist in me says, listen, there will probably never be enough money or attention for my art. And now that I am finally on my way to making it, I absolutely can't bring you along. It's like collaboration slows me down. So I'm going to do it myself. At the risk of sounding dramatic, <laughs> thanks Emily, <laughs> but seriously, I want to argue here that this cultural aversion to collaboration is actually life-threatening, and here's how. When we decide we're going to do it ourselves, we become like emotional in and intellectual hoarders, right? So if I start carrying all of my poems and all of my grief and all of my ambition really tightly to my chest. Of course, eventually, I'm going to realize this is all too much for me to carry, and I'm going to decide that I must be in excess of what I should be. And this is where we become prone to addiction and distraction and self-harm. And also, if I'm holding everything here, how am I ever going to do anything with my hands? But when I work with Emily, her low notes reach a part of my story that I can't quite touch, and her high notes take some of that excess off of my hands, and the lesson here is that you don't have to go carrying it all alone. I've seen collaborative writing work miracles in group settings, and so I want to tell some of those stories. Um, about a year ago, I visited a middle school to do a poetry workshop. And uh, I unknowingly walked into this super intense conversation between the teachers and the students about racism as it was playing out in the classroom. So the bell rings, interrupts the conversation. I go to the front of the room, and I'm like, let's write poetry. <laughs> but I can see it's not quite flying. Um, we do some journaling, but still I can feel that there's this excess 
of tension in the room. So I say, okay, take a fresh sheet of paper and pick one line from your journal that you're willing to share with a group. And then you're going to write one more sentence that begins with the words, you deserve, go. So the room does this, and then I let them know, we're all going to read our pages here. We're going to go all the way around the circle. This is going to be our big collective poem. And I call on a student to start. And she reads, what I mean to say is that I want to change so much, but I can't do it alone. You deserve to be heard and understood. And then we go all the way around the room, and finally we get to the teacher, who's also been participating in this exercise. And I ask her to read her page, and this is what happened. You should watch the screen. She says, myself a teacher, I gently struggle to both listen and guide. You deserve to be heard and understood. So the first reader and the last reader wrote the exact same words in their parts of the poem. This middle school student and her teacher have now moved the room from this excess of tension to the vulnerability of I can't do it alone, to this unintentionally choral line, you deserve to be heard and understood. Another example. In 2010, I had the privilege of working with a group of young Jewish activists who were gearing up for a major nonviolent direct action in which they would disrupt a televised speech of the Israeli prime minister. So I show up, and honestly, I feel like I'm bluffing, like, what can poetry really do here? This is a really big deal. <laughs> but we go through the process, and the result is this beautiful, collectively written poem, which they call a declaration. And what I learned there is that you can take a group of activists and ask them what they think about something, and you will get, again, this excess of opinions. But you ask them to write a poem together, and you can turn a statement like this one, we are against the occupation. And turn it into this invitational image like this. We will stand up with honest bodies to offer honest bread. See the difference there? <laughs> so the kicker here is this. The declaration that I just quoted from went live online the same day that the activists disrupted Netanyahu's, Netanyahu's speech. And so every press release that went out about the action linked back to this poem, which meant that people all over the world not only understood but could feel the intention behind this action. And this is the power of collective writing and of collaboration. It is bigger than us. My own personal story is this. When I moved to Seattle about seven years ago, I was having a very hard time, this idea of excess. Again, it was running my life. I was struggling with multiple eating disorders, most severely bulimia. I felt my body was too much, my secrets were too much, food was certainly too much. At the same time, I had recently come out of the closet, and so even my desire was too much. How I loved was too much. I was exhausted, and I was doing my best to carry it all around by myself. Thankfully, rather than give up, around this time, I joined a writing class. And the poem I'm about to share with you was one of the first things I wrote in my recovery. But a strange thing happened when I wrote it. I didn't just hear my own voice saying the poem. I heard a room full of voices. And so that's where you come in. You're actually going to help me read this poem. Uh, every time I say, get up off your knees, you in this room are going to say with me, sit down at the table. Let's practice once. Get up off your knees. Get up off your knees, baby girl. It's been too long since you've had something good to eat. Let mama cook you something warm while daddy rocks you, baby girl. You deserve a full plate. Get up off your knees. It's time to look me in the eye. Those eyes should not be wasted on dirty tile. Look at me, look at me. Get up off your knees. The big boys are playing. You can do this too. Pull out your swollen words, your large ideas. Slap them down and make them pay. You deserve to win this round. Get up off your knees. I will write down your story if you're ready to tell it. No more secrets. No more secrets. Baby girl, come sit next to me. Come sit down at the table. It's dinner time. 
Collaborations like this one keep me alive and living. Collaboration does not slow us down. It actually speeds us up together. We are bigger and we are truer. Together, we are brilliant. Thank you.